Hi everyone, my name is Nina Fry Kisler. I am the Senior Designer of Experiential Programs at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And I'm here today with Dr. Dean Radin, who is our Chief Scientist and a very prolific um, author and someone who does a ton of research in our field and has published so many papers. He actually has a really fun book that he published recently. I am going to talk to him today about a new project that is called, uh, it's about the Research Network for the Study of Esoteric Practices. And so I'm just going to start, Dean, by asking you a little bit about the study itself and to help people understand what it's about and what you're doing. This is actually funded both by the organization you mentioned, we call it RENCEP, and by the Be All Foundation in, in Portugal. They they're both looking at the same thing from slightly different directions. So the, the name of this project is Sigil, which is a magical practice used for enchantment. Sigil means symbol, uh, but it's also an acronym. So the acronym is, um, and I have to remember what I, what I called the acronym, um, Scientific Investigation of Gazing with Intention at Light. Mm. And so it's it's a uh, it's a cute way of talk of talking about the quantum observer effect, which is related to the idea that unlike in classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, when you observe something at the quantum scale, its behavior changes. And so the the mystery underlying this is why does observation do that? And so we're looking at photons in this experiment, and are the photons sensitive to being observed? Well, in physics, the, the, the underlying question is, what does it mean to observe something? And which is related to the idea of what does it mean to measure something? Because you have to observe it to measure it. And this then is called the quantum measurement problem, which was understood many years ago as being an unsolved puzzle, even though there are many proposals as to what it means. So in mainstream physics today, Many physicists would probably say that uh, when you measure a photon, you're interacting with it, you're interfering with it. And so its behavior changes simply because a photon is so small and light that any means by which you measure it is going to change it. That's that's kind of the, the, the hand-waving reason why we don't need to pay attention to it. The problem with that explanation is that it ignores two aspects of measurement, uh, one of which is called uh, interaction-free measurement. And the other one is called negative outcome measurement, both of which are techniques uh, devised to be able to tell what is going on inside an optical interferometer without interacting with the particle. So to explain, when you have a double slit optical system, which is the easy way to, to demonstrate that something's happening, you, you shoot a photon through two tiny slits and eventually goes through and it hits a screen behind it. And so if you don't, know anything about what, what the photons are going through the left or the right slit, and you just allow a bunch of them to go through, you will eventually end up with a uh, interference pattern on the screen that looks like uh, bands of light and dark. Mm -hmm. And so you say, well, why, why do we get that? Why do we not just get two bands of light? Why do we get this thing? Well, it's because of the wave nature of light. Mm -hmm. The wave, it, it is acting almost exactly the way that water would would act if you sent water waves through these two things. They interfere with each other and you end up with this pattern. The mystery is that if, you, if in the same apparatus, if you put a photo detector behind one of the slits, so you gain information about where what the photon is doing, then you no longer get an interference pattern. You get a pattern that looks like light is behaving more like particles. So this is the so-called wave particle nature of light. And it depends on what you know about the, the photons. So again, a, a conventional physicist might say, well, the reason why this happens is because when it hits the photo detector, it's changing the nature of the photons. So of course it would change its behavior. The thing is that if you put the photo detector behind one slit and then, and so you shoot the photon, you either detect it, like click, you found it, and then you get some kind of result on the screen itself. Well, what happens if you shoot a photon and you don't you don't get anything in the photo detector? It means you know that it went through the other side. Mm -hmm. So it had no interaction with anything. It went on the other side. You know it went through because it ends up on the screen, but it no longer acts like a wave. It's mm -hmm. acting like a particle. 
So this is this is one variation of a uh, interaction free measurement where it's your knowledge that you, of what is going on that seems to make the difference. Well, that's important because how do we gain knowledge? What does it even mean to gain knowledge? It suggests that there's something about conscious awareness or consciousness that is involved in the process. So the sigil experiment is one of a long line of experiments that we've done to see whether or not something about conscious awareness is involved in the behavior of photons uh, directly. So we were still using an opto optical, optical interference system in order to do these kinds of measurements, but nevertheless, it's all about what is the role of consciousness in the physical world. So that's what that experiment's about. Okay, great. Great explanation. And I wanted to ask if you want to share anything more about the actual details of the study itself in terms of um, are there participants? Are you um, anything else about how you're actually implementing the research itself? What, what I'll say is that uh, because of the involvement of RENCEP, the Research Network for the Study of Esoteric Practices, their interest is magic. Mm. Real magic, not not mm. stage magic. And so as part of the recruitment for the participants, I, I wanted to recruit 50 people to do this. So we went through a multi-step process to find people with the right kind of practices. And I settled on half of the people would be experienced meditators, and the other half would be experienced esoteric magicians. Mm. And the reason for that distinction is that the meditators usually have practice on inward focus of attention, whereas magicians have a, a practice on external focus of attention. Uh, meditators want to develop the inside. Magicians are interested in affecting the physical world outside themselves. And this experiment, the sigil experiment, uh, like any experiment in mind-matter interaction, is all about doing something to the outside world, not the inside. Right. Now, previously, I had usually recruited meditators mm. because I, I wanted to see whether people who had practiced in focusing attention, regardless of where it was going, might be better than people who are not did not have such practice. And there is evidence that that's the case. Mm -hmm. So now I'm doing more refined version of where is that practice focused. Mm -hmm. And so to make a long story short, we had ended up with 48 people who finished their assigned data and we analyzed everything. And the magicians did significantly better than the meditators. Interesting. So it does suggest that there's something about how you are focusing your attention. And it's a little bit, un, not, it's more unusual to find people who have practice and outward focus of attention, which in magic would be called enchantment. <laughs> they did better on this task. So that actually suggests even better ways in the future to select people were very focused on external focus of attention, which would include martial artists, mm -hmm. because that's also, a, especially people who do combat, because it's all about anticipating and observing what is happening outside of yourself, not inside so much. Interesting. Okay. And so you are, I just wanted, so you're done with the data analysis, and my guess is you're working towards publication at this point? Yes. Okay. I'm currently documenting the result. So this right. was a pre-registered experiment. So we, we had uh, three hypotheses that I, I registered before we did the study, and then that, that forms part of the description then of what we end up with. Okay, great. So now I'm gonna ask you the next question, which is the so what question. So why should this matter to people in their day-to-day -day lives and how might this impact the way that people think about their own consciousness and uh, capacity and things like that? Right. So consciousness, we can think of as having two components. One is awareness, like self-awareness, the, simply the idea that we're aware of anything that we have experienced. But the other aspect is agency. We feel that we have free will. There are arguments that say that we don't, but most people would agree that they have free will because even the ones who are arguing that we don't seem to be pretty passionate about that. And that seems to require some kind of internal free will to make that decision. So we have awareness and agency. It would be interesting to know whether the agent, where does the agency stop? Mm -hmm. So we know that things happen in the world because we have an idea and then we do something about it physically. But is it more than that? Is simply thinking about something in the world, does that actually influence it as well? 
So we kind of hear this in a sad way whenever there's a shooting, everyone offers thoughts and prayers. Well, if, you're in, if your sense of that is that all is it's doing is just internal self-care, that's okay. I mean, that's something. But what if it does something more than that? Well, right. there's 50 to 100 years worth of experiments on mind-matter interaction suggesting that not necessarily thoughts and prayers, but focused intention does influence the physical world at a distance outside of your body to a very small extent, mm -hmm. but nevertheless a real measurable extent that we can see in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Well, that changes the game completely yes. because now we're, we're engaged in some way in the way that the physical world works. Right. We don't know to what extent. Does it matter if it's a one person or a billion people thinking along certain lines? So the implications then is that your your thoughts, your intentions may be contributing to a very small extent, but nevertheless to a real extent mm -hmm. to the way that the physical world works. Mm -hmm. So if a billion people are all very sad and thinking everything's falling apart, that's probably not good for the physical world. Yeah. Whereas every everyone's hopeful and positive and thinking nice thoughts, that's probably good. That, right. That's a hypothesis. Right. So, so there's another reason. The other reason is that when you, you look at the, the nature of consciousness, especially, especially unusual kinds of experiences, uh, psychic, mystical, spiritual, magical, all of those that realm, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, they're all transformative. Yeah. They, they transform people from whatever personality they had before almost instantly. Mm -hmm. A single experience, a single psychedelic experience, a single experience will transform the person's personality into a pro-social direction. Mm -hmm. That means more empathy, more compassion, more pro-social behavior in general. Mm -hmm. So think about why we need to understand consciousness better is to figure out, well, why does that happen? Right. But why is it if you're pushed out of an ordinary state of awareness in a certain way, because you can get pushed out really bad and end up with PTSD, which mm -hmm. is not so good. But if there's the opposite of PTSD, it's not in a trauma direction, but in some other kind of direction, people transform and become very different in a positive way. Right. Well, if we understood why that happened and we were able to offer methods to people that where we knew that that was going to happen, that would change everything. Absolutely. Because the alternative is that we're hardwired to be aggressive primates, basically. We're monkeys. And we're very quick to anger and we, we react badly and all of that. that that's our hardwiring. It takes a certain degree of effort to not do that. Mm -hmm. like push, pull us away from that, that hardwired nature. Something about a consciousness transformation does that. It, it yeah. pulls us away from that nature into something that seems to be much more beneficial. That's why we need to understand the nature of consciousness overall better. Yes. And so in this, what I'm doing in these experiments is a tiny little piece of it saying that there's there are lots of things mysterious about consciousness, including that it somehow is interacting with the physical world, but it's way more than that. So that, yes. that's why IONS in general is focusing on what is the nature of consciousness what is its role in the physical world and what's it good for? Yeah. And just um, to add one more piece to this before we close, I just wanted to say this really ties back into ION's guiding hypothesis that everything is interconnected. So that if what you're talking about is people becoming more pro-social, that's going to, that ha can have a potential global impact yeah. on the way that we interact with one another. And, and it sort of takes away from some of what we consider to be separateness between ourselves and others and, and uh, the material world. So I just want to thank you so much for sharing. And if you would like to learn more about this study and about Dean, you can check out things in the comments. And we'll be back with another scientist, Garrett Yant, in a couple of weeks. So thank you so much, Dean. And it's great to see you. Thank you.